So the 2013 charts of Google's most popular searches in Australia are just in, with the top Google search at number one being what is twerking, shortly followed by who is God. Now on saying this, I don't think you have to be a genius to figure out which of the two questions is more important to be asking Google. I mean, one could potentially explain the reality of our existence, while the other would potentially leave us scarred for the remainder of our existence. And look, I know there's a lot of skepticism surrounding this issue and quite frankly, I don't blame you. I mean, the meaning of God has been thrown around so often we forgot what it means. From some Zeus-like man in the sky with a big beard, to Thor, to a half-animal, half-human creature, to Kanye West shamelessly producing a track titled I Am God on his album Yeezus, to Eminem then self-proclaiming himself as the rap god, a new brand of clothing titled I Am God, and who could forget Justin Bieber and his believers. You affectionately refer to your fans as beaners. N no believers. And now I understand that most of this may be exaggerated and many of these examples are mere semantics and plays on words that are probably being taken out of context as let's face it, nobody actually believes in Bieber and I highly doubt that Kanye West considers himself a god. When someone comes up and says something like, I am a god, everybody says, who does he think he is? I just told you who I thought I was, a god. And now Kanye West smashes his head into a street sign really, really hard. Oh, Kanye. Oh, Kanye. Kanye, you okay? Sounds like Kay's got a new hit. A oh, god. That's who I think I am. Oh, Kanye. Oh, Kanye. Kanye, you okay? So with all these misconstrued definitions of God, the least I could do is help clear the water and help us finally find out who is God. Well, to begin, let's start with the things that we all agree on. First and foremost, we're here. We just began and we exist. And like all things that begin to exist, they require a cause. Things don't just come out of nothing, and although at times we sometimes wish they would, they don't. If I told you that this glass sprang into existence, this glass made itself, you said Muhammad Ali's crazy. So on saying that, knowing the cause of us is crucial to understanding who God is. Although we are able to explain that we did have a beginning, as many leading cosmologists have affirmed, we are still left unanswered as to what was the cause of our beginning. And before you lash out saying, oh, but we can't see what happened before we began, or you can't prove there was a creator, we say quite openly, neither can you disprove a creator. And by observing the reality of our world and our existence, its order, its structure, and the systems, I see no reason not to believe in a creator. But then one may ask, where did this creator come from? What was the cause of him? And it will go on forever and ever which would most probably lead to us never have ever been created. So for God to exist, he must exist without a beginning, therefore not requiring a cause, making him eternal. He should also be transcendent from his creation and not bound by any of the realms he had created, whether it is time, space or matter. For instance, when Steve Jobs makes an iPhone, he doesn't become the iPhone, he is separate. And of course, we could also argue that he is one, this makes the most sense and it would also avoid any potential conflict between two disputing or powerful gods with conflicting interests. But we still don't know which god is he. Are you Zeus? Are you Thor? Are you Yahweh? Well, if you agree with everything I've said up until now, you will realize that each of these gods don't fit into our established criteria of who God is. They are all created beings, they are not eternal, they have not created anything, they are dependent, and they require sleep, rest, oxygen, and food. So who is the one and only true God? I present to you a God who is one and only, eternal, exists without a beginning, who was uncreated, requiring no cause for himself, yet being the absolute cause and creator of everything else, Allah. A simple definition of God that is logical and rational. There is nothing like him, no man, no creature, nothing imaginable. He is the one who is perfect, although I don't like using the word perfect because our understanding of perfection would never encompass his true essence. He is in control of everything whereby nothing can harm us unless he wills it. He is the all-knowing, the all-hearing, and unlike our friend Kanye, he is the all-seeing. Many of us would then argue that although these verses do provide a logical and sound concept of God, how do we know that these words are indeed the words of God? Well, first and foremost, the Quran isn't just any book. 
It was revealed over 1400 years ago as direct revelation from God to the final prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and was sent as the most eloquent piece of literature to before mankind. Revealed at a time where poetry was rife and to a population housing the best of poets only to leave them speechless and at a loss for words. Now what is important to note is that the Quran doesn't fit in any of the known classes of poetry nor prose. Rather, it is a fusion of both that even to this day shake the hearts of Muslims and non-Muslims alike. It's almost trance-like. I mean, it's, you can hear it's very euphonic. I mean, there's a lot of internal rhyme and end rhyme and uh, the rhythm is not predictable. And it's beautiful. Even to this day, the Quran remains incomparable and stuns humanity with its accurate references to science and history. From accurate descriptions of the human embryo to historically accurate references to the different rulers in the different Egyptian dynasties. And no matter how many times people will try to discredit the Quran on its authenticity, it remains standing. Will you please, at the very next science lesson, get some salt water, get some fresh water and mix them and see what happens. The Quran says two seas, not two cups of water. And to those that doubt it is from God, the challenge is simple. Bring forth something that can compare. And now although this challenge has been attempted multiple times throughout their past, history has witnessed that no man has been able to rival the Quran. But does this challenge still apply today? Well, we could surely put it to the test and who better to choose than the self-proclaimed rap god. Call yourself the rap god. Eminem, dubbed the best of his time, being incomparable with anyone in his league. The last thing the world needs is another me. Now, if we compare the works of Allah with the works of Eminem, we are left with this. Lickety gibbity hippity hip hop, rappity rap, pack and a mac in the back of the act, pack, pack, rap, yak, yakity, yak, yak, at the exact same time I attempt his lyrical acrobat stunts. <laughs> Look, content wise, I don't know. However, we can't deny that lyrically he is impressive. He has rhythm, rhyme, style, alliteration and assonance. A short video online even indicates that in one of his songs he almost made every second to third word rhyme. But how does he compare with the Quran's smallest chapter of three verses? Surah al kawfa Now in just 10 words, Allah is able to use over 30 linguistic and rhetorical devices, including emphasis, multiple meaning, grammatical shift, word order and arrangement, ellipsis, conceptual relatedness, intensification, choice of words, repetition, intimacy, exaggeration, and prophecy, along with many, many more. What's also important to note is that the linguistic devices in the Quran aren't just thrown about randomly. For instance, Allah would use palindromes strategically to describe the terms glorify your Lord and the orbiting of planets, as though both processes are occurring continuously, non-stop, one after the other. The shortest chapter in the Quran also contains a rhetorical device that no one can compete against nor replicate. Prophecy. At the end of the first verse, Allah promises Muhammad, peace be upon him, that he would be given abundant good at a time when he was at one of the lowest points of his life, with a small amount of followers and low social status. He had even just lost his son and his enemies were taunting him with cut-off lineage and progeny, yet Allah was promising him abundant good at this time. Such was the prophecy of the Qur'an, and we certainly indeed see its fulfillment today. With the Qur'an being the most recited, memorized and practiced book across the entire world, with over 1.6 billion followers today from all walks of life. Now I know many of you are probably thinking, okay, cool story bro, but what's the purpose of the Qur'an? Well, the importance is that it gives meaning to life, from our overall purpose of existence to why we're here and what happens once we die. God teaches us that each and every single one of us is being tested. We weren't created for mere play, we were created with a purpose, and that is to be obedient to God and His rules. Those who believe, there is reward, and those that don't and are arrogant, there is a punishment. And look, I apologize for trying to squeeze all this into one small video, but I've given you everything you need to know who God is and why we are here. So read.